OK, so where does this fit in? Again, our modern version of religion, our modern, very secularly influenced version of religion, so often involves an emphasis on what religion is about is counseling the troubled. What religion is about is holding the hands of the newlyweds and making sure they understand what they're getting into. What religion is about is comforting the, dis the bereaved. What religion is about is the good works. But this is not what religion has often been about throughout history. Often, the religious leaders are not necessarily the ones who are most psychotherapeutically minded or the most galvanizing of people into the good works. Often, religious leaders have been the ones at the head of a crusade. Often, religious leaders have been the ones with the most vivid images of what hell and damnation would be like. But often, what religious leaders have been are the people who are best at doing the rituals. And that has been another thread of religious practice throughout history of religious leaders as often being among the most fervent, the most accomplished at carrying out of rituals. Now, let me give you a sense of this, because as I began to read more on this, this absolutely astonished me, because I knew very little about this stuff, just the scale of this. How come people with OCD don't come down with learned helplessness? Why aren't they depressed? Because part of the fuel behind OCD is you're always convinced, aha, one more. Now I know, instead of doing it 17 times, 18. If I do it 18, then it's going to be perfect. You've always just figured out, not only do I have to do the six hours of washing, but make sure I never step on a crack, and then I won't break my mother's back. You're always figuring out the next step. OK, shifting over, just seeing orthodox Brahmin belief in Hinduism absolutely dominated virtually full time with ritualistic behaviors. Orthodox Jewry, a spectacular number of laws built around food preparation, the kosher laws, very detailed rules as to how long of a time interval between eating one type of food and another type of food. If you inadvertently mix up the silverware with different types of food, ritualistic cleansing rituals that you have to go through involving putting the utensils in dirt for months on end and special prayers that have to be said, rules about how you enter and leave a holy place involving certain prayers, involving a certain rit ritualistic touching that you have to make on the door jam there. All sorts of magic numbers. The, the number 18 has magical powers in Orthodox Judaism. And it's built around numbers of times you have to say a prayer, multiples of 18. You have these prayer shawls that have strings on the end, which have 18 knots in them. And they have to be pulled a certain number of times. Here's one of the amazing examples of ritualism. OK. These numbers have magical powers in Orthodox Judaism. And you will note 365 is the number of days in the year. 248 is the number of bones that people believed were in the bodies during the Middle Ages when this evolved. And together, 613, according to the holy books, there are 613 rules for daily behaviors. 365 prohibitions every day, 248 things that have to be done every day, the preponderance of the prohibitions leading one clearly fairly depressive rabbi back when to be saying, obviously it would have been better if none of us were born, given the fact that there were more things that we could mess up by doing. But what you see here is, which is highly ritualistic, the number of prohibitions equaling the number of days of the year, the number of ritual constraints equaling the number of bones in the body, 613 is the magic number. OK, where did these numbers come from? Very often in religious rituals, what you find is a number has symbolic value because it's got a certain appeal for making learning easier. It is not by chance that a base 10 society came up with 10 commandments, because 10 commandments then are much easier to remember than 9 or 11. What are these about? You would say, OK, well, there's some sort of ritualistic content here. God, the number of things God doesn't want us to do each day is equal to the number of days of the year. The number of things God wants us to do is equal to the number of bones in the body. OK, great device for remembering the rules. But here's the amazing thing. Thing, nobody knows the rules. You look through thousands of pages of commentary stretching back centuries, and the rules aren't written down. And various rabbis have made a living arguing over what are the 365 things you aren't supposed to do each day. In other words, the numbers are more important than the content. 
the content is less critical than the fact that whatever they are, there's 365 things that God doesn't want you to do. And whatever they are, there's 248 that God wants you to do. The number that you are attributing to God is more important in that case than the content. Okay. Classic, classic obsessive numerology. Switching over, traditional Orthodox Islam. What you find there is very detailed rules as to what foods you can eat, what the first food is you're supposed to eat each day. There are rules as to how you enter and leave a holy place. There are rules for very ornate cleansing after relie relieving yourself. Very, very detailed rules when you are washing out your mouth. How many mouthfuls of water, which hands you wash, in which sequence, the exact same thing, exact same rules as with an OCD person after the showering, explicitly written down, when a man is washing himself at the, ends of the at the end of the cleansing, should he happen to touch his penis, he has to do the whole sequence all over again. Magic numbers thought to have powers there, 7, 10, 70 and 100 apparently have magical powers in Islam, and you have very explicit, concrete instructions about them. Muhammad himself wrote down that a man who says a prayer with clean teeth gets 70 times the brownie points as a man saying his prayers without them. Multiples of magic numbers with all of that. So where am I heading with this? Obviously emphasizing the similarity of the traits and that whole business that once again have a six hour compulsion to wash your hands each day and have it occur in the secular context of OCD, it destroys your life. You cannot function in society, you are peripheralized, you are mentally ill. And that exact same theme, get it right in the right context and this is protected, this is honored, this is rewarded, get it in the right setting. Now nothing about being able to do r rituals and turn them from your own private OCD into the religious setting, this is not a process for making the anxiety go away. It's very important. When people are pulling off these rituals in a religious setting, it's not to make the anxiety go away, it's to share it. It's to share it over time and space with a larger community. It's to take this nameless dread and to give it a name. And to have that name come with feeding instructions and all sorts of rules for how to please the source of the named dread at this point. It's not to make the anxiety go away, it's to make the anxiety shared. Once again, what are religious leaders about? Mostly these days, we think of them in terms of people who are empathic, people who are able to use the religious tradition they come from to make people treat each other better, to comfort people during troubled times. But back to that issue that some of the time what a religious leader is about is someone who is excellent at doing rituals. And when you look at the history of religion, not only do you have the capacity for somebody to suddenly lose themselves, to finally have these same life-destroying rituals be sanctioned and protected, you have people who could make a living performing the rituals. You can have people who are amply rewarded for doing so. Some examples. Starting off with traditional Hinduism, there is a mantra there called the Gayatri mantra, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, but in traditional Brahmanism, you are supposed to say this mantra 2,400,000 times in a lifetime to guarantee a good afterlife. And what happens is you have these aging captains of industry who are worried that may not have quite gotten the right number in there and are feeling the years catching up with them. And what do you do? You hire yourself a bunch of Brahmins to come and say the prayer 2,400,000 times for you. And you say it in appropriate multiples. There are set rules. You hire 240 of them. So each of them says 10,000, 100,000, 1,000, 10,000. Each of them says a whole lot of them, and they all say the same number, and there are rules for what sort of tent city you put up for them in your backyard and what sort of feast you throw for them. You hire people to come and do the rituals for you that get you your afterlife. Switching over to Judaism, these rules of orthodox food preparation, there is an entire job you can get built around ritualistic preparation of food. 
now, there is a certain primary level of this, which is people who make a living making sure food is prepared in a kosher way, that they slaughter animals, things of that sort. But there's a whole second level, people who make a living watching the folks who prepare the food. You have rabbis who make a living sitting around in slaughterhouses and making sure the animals are slaughtered in a ritualistically appropriate way. These guys don't do anything with their own hands. Their entire job is to watch and make sure the rituals are done right so that you can produce like fat-free tofu hot dogs that would bring a smile to the lips of the patriarchs it's done so ritualistically correctly. These guys make a living doing this. And then the version probably we are most familiar with the American experience, you have the high school graduation, you have the opening of the new town, whatever, and what happens? The local clergyman comes out and does a convocation, says a prayer, is invited to come and do a ritual to mark this community transition. And our response here is, well, yeah, of course, that's the guy's job. And that's exactly the point. You could make a living doing these rituals. And you can do that job these days, complete with health insurance and a retirement package and a 401k and all of that. You make a living doing rituals. And when you look at the history of religion, suddenly what you see is an inevitable outcome of that. If there's somebody who's spending all his time washing his hands ritualistically for the good of the community, there's some peasant out there who's got to work by the sweat of his brow to make bread for two people instead of one. So what we get here at this point is the obvious question, who invented knocking on wood for good luck? Who's the Hindu who had some sort of obsession with the number 24, or the Jew with an obsession with the number 18? Who got this belief that God was completely obsessed with the numbers of bones in the body, and that's how many things you should do? What we have here is not only the recognition that if you are OCD, religion can provide a sanctuary. If you are OCD in the right setting, you can, in fact, make a living by being religiously ritualistic, but the recognition that probably people with strong obsessive compulsive tendencies had something to do with the invention of many of these rituals. I suspect historically that's where it has come from. So that brings up the issue that was brought up before. Why should these rituals be so similar? You look at the prohibitions, for example, in Judaism. More than 200 of these have to do with food preparation and cleansing. You see the sequence in any of these. And the top four in OCD are identical to the top four in all of these religions. Cleansing of the body, food preparation, entering and leaving significant religious places, and numerology, numbers. 